Last week I started a series, I don't know if it is a series, it's a teaching, simply called The Keys. How many of you were here last week? Yeah. All right, if you weren't here last week, you missed out. But it's all right, you can watch it online. All right, started a series called The Keys. The first key is the divine order. Praise God. You see, the people that were taking notes can remember. That's how it works. How many of you are note takers? Can I encourage you when you come to church, if you're an enjoyer, Take notes, even if it's just in your phone. Just take bullet points. Just take the point down. All right, the, the first key was the divine order of things. There is a divine order for your life. If you're a Christian, give me a wave, you're a Christian. All right, you need to work out the divine order because what's anointed at the top is going to flow down from that space. That was, the first, that was the first key. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 19, Jesus says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, not a key, but keys, there's a key for your life. There's a key for your marriage. There's a key for your children. There's a key for your finances. There's a key for your health. Amen. How many of you know God wants you to be healthy physically? There's a key for every part of your life, and it's all in the Word of God. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. Now, if you come around our house, there's one question that gets asked more than most. What do you think that question would be? Where are the keys? No, but it's very close. The question would be from Georgie saying to me, what are you looking for? <laughs> and the second is like it, where are my keys? Amen. That's how it works. It's like, because without the keys, how many of you have worked out? Without the keys, you're not going anywhere. Have you worked it out yet? How many of you have been trying to move forward but you can't seem to move forward. You're trying to get into a new season, but you can't get into the new season. Friends, I want to encourage you today. We need the keys of the kingdom of God, all right? Because without the keys, we're not moving anywhere. Without the keys, we're not getting into where God would have us go into. All right, so many of us are within the kingdom of God. And while being in the kingdom of God, we're lacking the traction and the momentum and we're not entering into what we're believing for, simply because we're not using the keys that have been given to us by Christ that we might unlock our futures that are in Him. How many of you believe God has got a future for you? All right, let me, okay, so, so 18 of you out of like hundreds and hundreds. Uh, so, eight, so how many of you believe God's got a, a future for you? He's got a plan, He's got a purpose. How many of you know you're going to need the keys to unlock it? All right. All right, Nathan, you're going to need keys to unlock hearts. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> Moving right along. All right, so, so how many of you know God's got keys? So some of you are like, that was nasty, Shane. I'm back, praise God. All right, I'm here to help. I've got my eye on you. So this guy keeps coming from Adelaide. I don't know why, but anyway, praise God. I said, I don't mean to embarrass anybody, Nathan. All right, so, so but I see it all. How many of you see it all? I see shepherd see stuff. Like you guys are still sitting together in the front row. Praise God. It's awesome. All this romance happening everywhere. It's beautiful. Who here would like some more romance in their life? Give me some. Give me some. All right. So, so, so. Randy. Praise God. Randy. Yeah. So. <clears throat> this, this, a lot of hands went up there. Usually I ask that question. Everyone ducks. But now it's like COVID is over and I'm available. <laughs> I've been on the couch for two years, but I'm good to go. Helping you, Randy? You're like, you're not helping anybody. All right. Yeah, that's good. It's just romance everywhere. I like it. Praise God. Could have some fun, couldn't we? Matchmaker at Enjoy Church. Do it. <laughs> now they're begging for Matchmaker at Enjoy Church. Not begging, but enthusiastic. Praise God. All right. So. So God wants to give us keys that we can begin to unlock our future. And, and even though I am mucking around with unlocking hearts, as you just heard, it's actually true. Man, if you want your wife to be affectionate, find the key. If you want your children to re respect you and honor you, find the key. It's like God will give you keys, and in some ways it's not rocket science, but what it is is biblical. And when we take the Word of God and not just hear it, but apply it in our life, how many of you know things are going to begin to move? So God wants to give us keys because He has a plan 
and he has a future here for us on earth. So last week's key was simply the key of divine order. This week's key, are you ready now for all of you that are taking notes, which is every enjoyer in the house, I'm sure. This week's key is called, called the principle of the first. The principle of the first. Now, the truth is, I should spend a year preaching on this because it is all the way through Scripture. You can do your own word study. We're going to get, I'm just going to give one session to it because it's in the context of a whole key ring that we're trying to get through. And so, so, but it's called the principle of the first. In our time together today, we're going to just have a look in the Scripture. We're just going to touch the surface, scratch the surface, and see if there might be, search and see if there might be a Scripture principle here that, that we could call the principle of the first. If we believe that there is a divine order of things, how many of you believe there is a divine order of things? If we believe there is a divine order of things, doesn't it make sense that first things have to be first? Now, of course it does. It's like it's stating the obvious. I was talking to Mick and I was talking to Georgie this week and it's like on my key ring, I have, this set, of, I have a key, set of keys like you have a set of key, keys. I don't leave home with one key. I leave home with a, a key ring that's full of keys. And all the keys touch each other and they all hang together and they're all, so they're all related. You can't separate them out. I never leave home with one key. I leave home with all of them. God wants to give us the keys of the kingdom that when we leave home and set out on this journey called life, we might have all that we need to unlock every area that the blessing of God might flow into every place. And everybody said, amen. amen. So we're going to jump straight in today. If you've been traveling on a plane recently, you would have heard them say, you would have heard them say something along the lines of, uh, in, the, uh, in case of an emergency, an oxygen mask is going to fall from the ceiling uh, before you help or assist anybody else, make sure you put on your face mask first, first, put yours on first uh, before you help anybody else. How many of you know on an aeroplane, it's a great idea? I want to encourage you all, if the aeroplane's falling out of the sky and you're doing 900 kilometres an hour towards the ground, put on your face mask, you know what I'm saying? In that case, it makes perfect sense because that's an emergency. But how many of you know a me first attitude or mindset in the kingdom of God is never going to work. How many of you know a me first attitude in your marriage, just ask your spouse now, it's not going to work. A me first attitude in your family is not going to work. A me first attitude in church is not going to work. A me, it doesn't work in the kingdom of God. If you're putting yourself first, how many of you know it's going to be upside down because the divine order of things is upside down and back to front? And everybody said... Amen. So in the case of an emergency, absolutely. But most of us aren't living in an emergency. Most of us are looking to build life. How do you build a life that's going to stand against the storms and against everything else? You build upon the rock, which means you build upon the Word of God. Matthew chapter 6 from verse 33 says, But seek first. Everyone say first. 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 Everyone say first. first. That's better. Praise God. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you as well. Not adhering to the divine order of things as we learned last week is going to prevent the divine anointing from flowing over the divine order of things. We want the divine anointing to flow, but we're not necessarily buying into the divine order. But when we set the order up in the way that it should be, then the anointing is going to flow as it should flow. When our worship, when our altar, when our life before Christ is, is right, then in, out of that secret place, the anointing of God is going to fall upon us and then upon our family and then upon our work. It doesn't work the other way around. So many people are like, I'll get around to worship. I'll get around to the altar. I'll get around to that space. But friends, we don't want to be a people who get around. We need to put God first because when we put God first, when the divine order is set up, then it's going to flow down and it's all going to be good. So when Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, effectively what he's saying here is, when you seek me and my ways first. That's what Jesus is saying. All right. Every enjoyer, we are disciples of Christ. We live for him. We die to ourselves. When we went through the waters of baptism, we said we, were, we are dead to ourselves and alive to Christ. 
So now we're going to begin to live a different way. We're going to begin to do life differently. So Jesus is like, all right, so if you're going to do it, if you're going to be my disciple, then what you need to work out is you need to work out who I am, you need to work out my ways, and you need to work out the ways of the kingdom. <laughs> Jesus is saying when you seek me in my ways first, the blessing of the kingdom will begin to flow upon you. And, and the, the, then from there, you're going to find yourself, because you're seeking him, you're seeking the kingdom, you're seeking his righteousness. You're going to find, as you step into that secret place, the other areas of your life are going to begin to make sense. Because the anointing of the secret place is going to begin to flow out into all the other places. When we, when we pursue the other things and put them first, the order's out. The flow doesn't happen. But when we run to the secret place, now how many of you know, when I'm talking about a life of worship, I'm not talking about four songs on a Sunday morning. It's like, like we were talking about before, sometimes, but whatever. As in, I find it humorous when people say, I didn't get anything out of worship this morning. And I'm like, well, it wasn't actually for you. <laughs> it's like, uh, how great I am. No, no, no. Doesn't, it's not for you. It's for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You know what I'm saying? I hope we die in worship. You know what I'm saying? I hope we walk in one way, die to ourselves, and walk out another. And so when I talk about worship, I'm not talking about four songs on a Sunday morning. I'm talking about a life that is lifted before God as a holy sacrifice. It's like, Lord, this is, this is my life and it's all for you and I want to give it to you. And when we, when we bring our lives into the secret place, and that is on a Sunday morning, and that is on a Sunday afternoon, and that is on a Monday and a Tuesday and a Wednesday, it is all the time. It's like we don't step in and out of a life of worship. Worship is our disposition. Worship is what we're about. Worship is who we are. Come on, give God praise if you believe that. I don't know about you. I'm still a believer. You know what I'm saying? I'm still a believer. So we've got to get this part worked out. Now, if you're struggling to understand... What, 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 his righteousness, what, what does his righteousness mean? Just think about it this way. What is right when I'm in Christ and in the kingdom? That's what righteousness, when we're talking about seeking him and his righteousness, uh, uh, seeking the kingdom of God and his right, it's about what is right when, I, when I'm in him, when, I'm my, when my life is alive in him, and when I'm in the kingdom, what is right? How many of you know we've got to get this part worked out? We've all grown up in different spaces. We've all grown up in different churches. We've most, most of us have grown up in different countries to varying degrees. We've grown up in different families. And we all have a belief system. How many of you know you've got to watch your BS? It'll get you into trouble. Praise God. Put that down right there. You can tweet that. Belief systems will get you into trouble. Get you into trouble. You've got to watch them. Because sometimes our belief system and the Word of God aren't in alignment. And I can promise you this, God is not going to come into alignment with you. We're going to come into alignment with the Word of God. That's why we need to be a people of the Word. And everybody said, Amen. All right, so we've got to work out now what is right. What is right? Okay, remember when John the Baptist was trying to prevent Jesus from uh, being baptized by him, by John? And they're having an argument because John's doing the baptizing out in the Jordan. Jesus is like, I want to be baptized. And John's like, I don't think so. I know who you are. <laughs> I don't think I want to baptize you. <laughs> I think you should baptize me. It's like, well, can we take it in turns? No, we can't take it in turns. Jesus is like, oh, cuz, cuz. Because how many of you know they're cousins? So he's like, cuz, like all of you call each other cuz. You know what I'm saying? Hey, cuz, I need you to baptize me. And so there's this argument going on backward and forward. Listen to this, Matthew 3.15. Now, I'm reading from the Amplified because it just, it says it so clearly. But Jesus replied to him, hey, cuz, he didn't say that, but that's what I said. Permit it just now. For this is the fitting way. Now, if you were to go to many of your translations, the word there is proper. It is proper for this to happen. What is proper in the kingdom of God? I know we've all been caught, taught different things over the years. We come from different families, all the rest of that. But what is proper in the kingdom? Not in your family, not in the country of origin, not in the church you grew up in. In the kingdom of God, according to Scripture, what is proper? 
for this is the fitting. This is the fitting way, the proper way for both of us to fulfill all righteousness. That is to perform completely whatever is right. Whatever's right. Jesus is saying to John, John, we've got to do this, bro, because this is right in the kingdom of God. This is right in the kingdom of heaven. Brothers and sisters, can I encourage you, let's be a people of the word that we might know what God says is right, not just what our mama says is right or the neighbour says is right. We need to know what does God say is right. All right, so we're getting it. Now we want to give God first, amen? All right, so the second key is God first. Everyone say God first. All right, you can do better than that. Everyone say God first. All right, it's 12.30. I can get there if you help me out. If you don't help me out, it's five o'clock. I promise you, five o'clock. No one gets out. Shut the doors. No, not really. All right. All right. Here we go. Point number one. We're talking about the first. This is the key. We've got to give God first. Here we go. Point number one. God wants the first of our devotion. He wants the first of your devotion. What are you hopelessly devoted to? We were talking in the first service about the fact that Olivia Newton-John passed this week. Who shed a tear? Anybody here shed a tear? <laughs> Hands go up. I, I did. I don't know whether it's because when I was in high school, I was in love with her or not. I don't know. <laughs> George is not here. You can tell her later. I'm confessing. You know what I'm saying? It's like, Sandy, Sandy. Anyway, moving right along. But, but it's like, I shed a tear because everyone loved Olivia Newton-John. Like, you can tell she had a big heart. She loved people. As in, no one had a bad word to say about her. But my, 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 my tear was a little bit like, as in, uh, that, was, that was a big part of our life. She was part of our life, but, but now I don't know where she's gone. I never heard her talk about her faith. She cared for people. She wanted them to be well. But how many of you know you can only be so well without the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords being resident? And so I just hope, I pray that, that somehow in the middle of that, that, that's where she found herself. But, but she sang that song, Hopelessly Devoted. What are you devoted to? What, what holds the, the heart of your devotion? We're all here and, and like we're trying to work this thing called life out, but where is your devotion? Where does it lie? In Matthew 22, verse 37, it says, Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Now, how many of you would agree if you're loving God with all, 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 there's probably not much left. Everything, God's going to get the first of it all. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Not the same, but the second is like it. I want you to hear this. There's a connection, a correlation. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law of the prophets hang on these two commandments. So Jesus wants to be first and desires to be the center and the first of our devotion. I don't know about you, but I want to know what does God want? I'm a little bit over living for myself. <clears throat> I'm a little bit over living for everybody else. I'm a little bit over living for the family because the family has got demands. I'm a little bit over it all. I want to know what does Jesus want? What can I bring to God that's going to be pleasing to Him? And bring joy to Him. That's why I was referring to the joy factor in the heart of God before. When, when He hears our worship, it's like, Lord, how can I live in a way that is pleasing to You, that's going to bring joy to You? Friends, He wants all of you, all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your devotion. Now, you know as well as I do, there's so much in the world today vying for our devotion. As in so many things, pulling us this way, pulling us that way. All the time trying to get it, their hands on us and... And, and it's not all bad. I, it's not all bad and it's not all wrong. But when Jesus isn't the first of all in the divine order of things, things are out of order. All right? This how it's, I'm helping you now. If, if Jesus isn't first, your order isn't right. All right? Let's, go, let's just call it as it is. And you might be like, why are you? Why are you? It's like, because like, church, if you get this and you put the order right, if you put first things first, if you honour the Lord first, how many of you know out of that secret place, the glory of God is going to come and it's going to come upon you into every part of your life that matters. So I'm a devoted husband. I've been married once. I plan to stay married once and that's it, period, full stop. But there's one thing I know, I'm not there yet. 
33 years of bliss. It's been incredible for Georgie. She's so blessed. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you, I, I love being married. I want to be a devoted husband. I love being a dad. I got, I got uh, obviously two daughters and a Konnichiwa son-in-law. That is like a son to me. I love my son. He's like, he's probably more like me than my daughters. Bizarre. It's, uh, and then I, got, then I got Leora. Oh, my Lord. My granddaughter. Oh, my Lord. She's what? Oh, she's the most beautiful little bag of skin you've ever seen. Oh, I love my girl. I, I love her. Love her. I, you can tell I'm devoted to her. I'm devoted to my, my two daughters and my son of choice. Uh, and, and I want to be... I want to be devoted. I want to be the best husband I can be. I want to be the best dad I can be. I want to be the best grandfather I can be. I want to be the best friend I can be. I want to be the best pastor I can be. But this one thing I know, if Jesus isn't first, I'm never going to be the devoted husband I want to be and need to be and my wife needs me to be. I'm never going to be the devoted father. My children need me to be and I want to be. And, and it's like, it comes out of my devotion to God. Some of us, are, it's, like it's out of order. He's not first anymore. He used to be first. And then these other things have been reaching him. But when I elevate, when I elevate these things in my life to first place, I negate the power of God that is meant to be at work, that the, the things of the kingdom might be released in my life. I don't want to squash the power of God. I want the power of God to be released in my life. And everybody said, Amen. When I came to Christ, my, the truth is, like my life, I was just a shell. I was like, I was, like I, was, I was a mess. I was broken. But as I devoted myself to him and gave him all of my heart, all of my soul, and all of my mind, because I've been made new and are being renewed, heart, soul, and mind, now I'm able to truly be devoted to my wife and to my children, my grandchild and church, etc. Friends, it flows out of that first devotion. Where, where is your heart of devotion? If I was to ask you, we're going to go here in just a minute, but if I was to ask you today, where does your devotion lie? Nathan, if I was to ask you, where does your devotion lie? What would you say? Don't, don't say it out loud, Nathan. Uh, it's like, but if I was to ask you, what would you, where, where is it? Now, understand this. For me, I'm just stating the obvious. Sometimes the obvious needs to be stated. It needs to be asked by someone who loves you enough to ask you the question that you and God might go to work. So, here we go. Point number one, God wants to be the first of our devotion. Point number two, he, God wants the first of our time. Everyone say time. How many of you have got time? How many of you got no time anymore? How many of you are busy, 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 busy? Anyone? It's getting quiet in here. I reckon, I reckon we're starting to put our finger on some things. You guys aren't smiling as much as you were on the way in. On the way in, you were like, hallelujah. Now you're like, hallelujah. All right. That's all right. It's going to be good. God wants the first, everyone say first, of our time. Now, without wanting to be nasty, because you know me, I'm not nasty, but I do want to go there, and I do feel to go there. Like I said, I don't want to be a speaker. I want to be a pastor. I want to help us all. I want to help everyone watching online. We want to move forward into what God has got for us. And so without wanting to be nasty, I want to, this is what I want to say. It's not actually that hard to see where people's devotions lie because typically their time priorities will spell it out. You can say what you want, about who gets first in your life, but where you spend your time shouts all the way to heaven. It shouts. All right. Psalm chapter 90, verse 12 says, teach us the number of our days are right that we may gain a heart of wisdom. How many of you want wisdom? Eight of you, praise God. How many of you want kingdom wisdom, biblical wisdom, godly wisdom? All right. It begins with 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 what? Numbering our days are right. We're going to talk, and I reckon there might be one or two or ten realize maybe we've been numbering our days are wrong, not are right. There is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. 
So we want to know the right way. Lord, what is right in your eyes? Because we want to live a life that is honouring and pleasing of you to you. How, how many minutes do you have in an hour? Good. How many hours in a day? How many days in a week? How many weeks in a year? 52. Is it the same for all of us? Oh, same for all of us. We're all in the same boat. We all get time. Time, time, time. We all get an allotted time. So my question to you today is this. Who or what will be getting the first of your devotion? Well, I'll, I'll put it this way. Who or what is going to get the first of your time? Where's it going? Where's it going? I'm not asking you to yell it out loud, but I want you to take it to the Lord and begin to process it. We sat down earlier this week to work out our calendar for 2023. <laughs> it's like uh, 2020, bonk! <laughs> Feels like it was a black hole. 2021, bonk! Another black hole. 2022, all right, we're up and about. We're starting to make progress again. All right, now we're looking at the 2023. You know what we did? We, got, we sat in the boardroom and we've got a table up there and over the, over the whole table, almost the whole table, Rachel set out the month by month by month calendar and here's the whole year set before us. Nothing is on it. The first thing we do when we look at our calendar is work out the big rocks. All right, what are the things that we need to put on the calendar that are non-negotiables? All right, Christmas. How many of you know Christmas is Christmas every year? This is something that's a stable in our diet and enjoy church. It's in the calendar. Easter is in the calendar. Uh, uh, summit is in the calendar. Covenant Conference is in the calendar. Adore is in the calendar. And so on and so on. The big rocks are the non-negotiables. Can I ask you a question today? When you look at your calendar for the week that is before us, what are the non-negotiables? Because that will tell you what gets first. It really will. And you're like, oh, don't be so harsh. I'm not being harsh. I'm just asking the question. What are the non-negotiables in your life that you're like, I'm not, as in, these things are never going to move. Never going to move. Well, God gets the first of my devotion. Pastor Shane, is it? Let's just, let's just talk about it. Can't we all be friends here? Yeah, we can be friends. All right. So let's just put it out there. <clears throat> as in, God gets the first of my life. But Pastor, Richmond are playing at one past ten. No, ten past one. For one past ten, the game would be over. And Richmond beat Hawthorne again. Praise God. R Richmond and Hawthorne are playing at ten past one on Sunday. It's like there's only two games in the season left, so I'm not going to be in church. Have a good day. All right, so now we know. We're going to bow down and worship the tiger. Praise God. Some of you are like, oh, that's harsh. That's harsh. No, it's, it's, it's not. It's real. Because now I'm prioritizing a footy game. You know I love the football. You go into my office, there's... Football stuff everywhere. Hate to disappoint you. There's no crosses up there at all. Someone gave me a little Jesus that sits on a, on a dashboard. That's up there. But other than the little Jesus that sits on a dashboard that sits on, the, on my desk, there's nothing. But there's tiger, tiger memorabilia everywhere. But how many of you know I will never step out of church to go to a football game? And you might be like, that's because you're a pastor. No, it's because I love Jesus. And my worship is important to me and I believe it's actually important to God. Now, if you're here and you have stepped out occasionally to the football game, praise God, there's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. But let God do in you whatever it is that God wants to do. If he's looking to move something, just let it happen. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Praise God. You can thank me later for this sermon. This is awesome. All right. So, so then what about, what about, what about we, we, heard, we heard before how, how people were praying for a job and they get the job. How many people over the years get the job and then it's like, we can't be in church on Sunday because we've got a new shift. So on one hand, they're here thanking Jesus for the job and then they're no longer coming to church because they're working Sundays. Praise God. You guys are enthused today, I can tell. What about our kids that can't be in church because our kids, they, they want to play sport on Sunday morning. It's like, of course they do. And I know they're going to be playing for the soccer ruse in the future. I get it. Of course they are. Because they're your kids. They're my kids. They're our kids. But what does it teach our kids? That kicking a little bag of air is more important than our worship. Now, if you know me, I'm not looking to land on anybody today. Hear my heart. 
But so often we're prepared to put everything else. It's like there's a Maya sale on. My wife wants me to go to Maya's with her. I don't even like shopping, but I have to take her. I want to go for a ride on my bike. Throw the bike in the creek. Get yourself to church. We say God is first. And in our head he is. But in our heart, we put other things above him and before him. I said, I'm not looking to bust anybody today. You know me. I do want to help you though. I do want to help you. I want you to find, because there's something happens when, when you bring, you know, sometimes even just coming to church is a sacrifice because you really do want to go see Richmond and Hawthorne, as in me too, but not before God. As I, I really do want to take my granddaughter to the, but not before God. And I understand there's times and there's things, and I get that. I'm not looking to say black and white, and because that's calling would we hate them. And so, but I'm looking. Don't be like that. Don't judge me. Don't judge me. It just out of the abundance of the heart, it just comes out. So, but we're not looking. Well, I'm not looking to be black and white and make rules and laws. But the heart of love is, Lord, you are first. I'm not going to move anything. I'm not going to move anything. No, 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 no. I'm not moving anything. A week that doesn't have, all right. So teach us the number of our days. Okay. You, you got a, you've got a calendar. I've got a calendar. We're going to put it whatever, wherever. For me, I put it on Instagram yesterday. Our worship experience for me is so important to be able to come together. Now, you might be like, some people say you don't need to go to church to be a Christian. I say you don't even know Jesus. That's what I say. And if you don't, whatever. Like I said, I'm sick of nonsense. It's like, show me the, show me the footballer that never goes to training or go to the MCG. It's like, what the heck? I can be a, I can be a Christian without being joined to the body of Christ. Well, what are you going to be? A little finger out there living by yourself. Hello. What's your, what's your, I'm just looking for some fellowship out there if anybody... So what the heck? You know as well as I do, we need each other. You know, it's like, we, we need the good, the bad, and the ugly, and there's plenty of it, you know what I'm saying? Because it's doing life with people. In our family at times, we need to sit down and have conversations and work things out. That's called church life too. It's like, God put you in a family. When you were born again, he didn't put you, he didn't say, well, you just hang out there on the shelf and when I find, no, 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 no. He's like, immediately, as soon as you were born again, you were born again into the kingdom of God, into the family of God, and you're meant to be planted in the church of God. It's really that simple. <laughs> a week that doesn't have time that is holy and allocated unto the Lord is a week that's numbered wrong. If you're like fluid in it all and God doesn't have that spot somewhere, something's wrong with your week he, it, it, because it reveals God is neither first or preeminent anywhere. So God wants to be first. He wants the first of our devotion. He wants the first of our time and he wants the first of our increase. Now, I'm going to ask the worship team to come and we're about to have communion in just a minute. This is what it says here in Genesis chapter 4, verse, reading from verse 3. In the course of time, which time? In the course of time. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. But Abel brought fat portions. Everyone say fat portions. How many of you like fat portions? How many of you, when you're having a steak, want the fat portion? Oh, hallelujah. Uh, brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favour on Abel and his offering. Cain, he wasn't looking with favour. Why was that? Because God's a vegetarian and the lights just went on? Is it because God is a vegetarian? Is it because God likes barbecue? That he looked upon Abel's offering with favour and not Cain's? Is that what it's about? No, 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 no. That's not what it's about. Even though I don't see uh, any asparagus in the burnt offering range in the Old Testament, but that's beside the point. I don't, I don't like asparagus either. So, so what's it about? It's about Cain in the fullness of time, the course of time. He's like, well, I'll just get some of, what, what's left on the shelf? What's the bruised stuff? What's the leftover stuff? What, is there anything I can just take to the house of God? I'll just give God whatever. 
where, where Abel, Abel is like, I want the fat portions of the first. The fat portions of the first. Friends, can I encourage you today? Because this is the, uh, the, the three-month period of God first. And I wasn't thinking about that when I actually put this message together. But there is so much tied to this space. More than I think any of us actually understand. There's so much tied to it. And I'm going to try and get through it really quickly. But it's going to highlight to you the importance of your tithe. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 12, it says, bring the whole tithe. How many of you know it doesn't say give the whole tithe? It doesn't say give. Why, why doesn't it say give? Because it's not yours to give. It's the tithe, the first 10% is God's. Every good and perfect thing comes down from the Father above. It's all God's. But He says, you have 90%, but I want the first 10% back. All right, so, so He's asking for that 10%. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I'll not throw open the floodgates of heaven heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have enough room for it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops. How many of you know there's blessing? When you walk in obedience, there's blessing. When you walk in obedience, there's protection. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops and the vines in your fields will not cast their fruit, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. Okay, so we see there is blessing and protection for those who trust the Lord and walk in obedience. Now, I say obedience because, friends, I want to encourage you tonight. And as I say this, this is a word to go out to all of Enjoy Church. And no doubt, Martin will hear this and pick up on it and it'll go everywhere. When we bring our tithe, can I encourage you, understand this. When you bring your tithe to the Lord, you're not being generous. It's not generosity. And it's like, what do you mean you're not being generous? You're not being generous because it's not actually yours to give. It's yours to return. It's yours because God gave it to you. He put it in your hand to see then what you were going to do with it. What you do with it, that's up to you. As I said, it's like, well, it's to be returned to God. It's not actually ours. Huh. So now we want to bring our tithes and offerings to the Lord. And we're going to see a passage of Scripture that you're, and you're going to say, I never thought I would hear any pastor say what I'm about to say. I promise you, some of you are like, you're going to hear this, you're going to be like, I, I would have never thought any pastor would say this. All right. So now we want to bring our tithe and we want to bring our offerings. Your offering is generosity. Your tithe is, gen, uh, is obedience. All right. We've got two hands here, tithes and offerings. Tithe is obedience. When you walk in obedience, it brings about the blessing and the protection of God. When you walk generously, you're going to be refreshed. He who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. So it's going to come back. All right, so now we're bringing our offering to the house of the Lord. Matthew 5, verse 23, it says, Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and therefore, so we're not talking about a tithe or an offering here. We're just talking about bringing an offering, uh, and offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you. All right, let's get real here. How many of you, as you came to church today, you're aware that there might be a brother, there might be a sister that you're just not good with. You're not good with. It's, it's like it's not working out here. Welcome to family. And you realize your brother has something against you. What does the Scripture say? Leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother. Then come and offer your gift. All right. So what are we saying here? Because one minute we're saying how important the tithe is and how important offerings are. And I am. I'm not departing from that, but there is some things that are greater in the scheme of things. The first commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength. All... So we're going to love God with all that we are. The second commandment is like it, that we must love our brother, sister as ourselves. All right. So now I'm commanded to put my, my, my gift down at the altar. I've come to church. I'm ready to put in the offering. And the Scripture says, put it down before the altar and go, be reconciled, then come and do what you've got to do. What I encourage you today, if you're bringing offerings to church today and you realize someone's got something against you, don't leave anything around here. It's going to get stolen. You know what I'm saying? It's all right. Kidding, kidding. Not kidding. Don't leave it. Don't leave valuables around. But the point is, we've got to leave it. Go take care of real business. 
Really? Now, I wish I, could, I wish I could say to you that we can change the Scripture because many of us do. Many of us want this verse to say, if you come in the church and you're presenting your gift to the Lord and there you remember you have something against your brother, put it down. But that's not what Scripture says. The Scripture says, you remember that your brother has something against you. Put your offering down and go and be reconciled. And it's like, so are you, are you saying I am now responsible for my brothers and sisters' hearts? No, I'm just telling you what God says. Am I my brother's keeper? Am I my sister's keeper? Yes. All right, so then how important is the tithe and the offering? Very important to God, but not more important than the first things. And the first is the devotion that we would have with God and we would have to each other. And then out of that, everything else can tag along. Now, why is it so important to come along and fulfill the commitment that we were starting to make? Because it's never just about a tithe and it's never just about an offering. All right, you ready to go deeper, a little bit deeper for a minute? Just as we get ready to wind up, here we go. Matthew 23, 23, they call this the Jordan verse. Jesus speaking to his accusers. Some of you will get that when you get home. It's okay. Matthew 23, verse 23. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees. You hypocrites, you give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. All right, so you see there, when it comes to the, to the tenth, it's a tithe. But there's some things that are more important than the tithe. The way we deal with each other, the matters of justice and mercy and faithfulness. All right, but we're going to go deeper. You ready to go again? So like we're deep diving today. Luke chapter 16, verse 10. All right, this is why it's so important we go full circle, come back and, and do what we should be doing with our tithe and offering. Here we go. Whoever, so Luke 16, verse 10. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. Take that into the scripture of Malachi and it says, why are you robbing me? Why are you robbing me? And they're like, we're not robbing you. What are you talking about we're robbing you? And it's like, in the tithe, in the tithe and the offerings, you're doing whatever you want with them. In the eyes of God, that's robbing. Now we go into the New Testament and God is just putting it out really clearly. If we're dishonest with little, we're gonna be dishonest with much. Verse 11, so if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? Friends, I want to encourage you. We put so much on the value of a dollar, but in the kingdom of God, dollars are just dollars. I don't know about you. I want to walk in power. I want to walk in authority. I want to see the miraculous. I want to see God moving in my marriage, God moving in my family. These are the true riches. And so much is proven in the way that we treat the first 10%, the first of our time, the first of our devotion. Verse 12, and if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, the tithe, who will give you property of your own? Praise God as the singers come. Friends, God desires to pour out His love, His goodness, and His mercy upon our lives. He wants to do it so badly that He sent His Son Jesus to die on a cross to establish a new and living way. And it's the most beautiful way. This is what I love when people have a revelation of Christ. Well, they just do what they do because they love Christ. They search the Scriptures, they find out what pleases Him, and they just live it for God. I love the fact that when we honour God and we give Him first, we step into the covenant and as recipients of the covenant, we enjoy the blessing of God. 